Okay, so hi everyone. Welcome to the CS Colloquium at the Hebrew University. We're happy to have Daniel Deutsch with us. Daniel is an associate professor at Tel Aviv University. He obtained his PhD from also from Tel Aviv University and he was a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Pennsylvania and INRIA in France. His research is about database applications and web, web data management, studying both theoretical and practical aspects. Uh, his uh, research won numerous awards, including the VLDB Best Paper Award in 2017, the 2016 Creel Prize, and some other awards. Uh, we're very happy and excited to have him with us. And uh, the stage is yours. Daniel, good luck. Thanks, Stephen, and thanks for having me. Um, so I will talk today about explainability, and uh, um, I will talk about explainability in the context of data science. Um, as we will see, there are two distinct areas of research that come into play here. One is called data provenance, and that's explanations from the database size. And then there is uh, a, a, the area of explainable AI, which looks for explanations for machine learning models and, and their results. And I will ask, can the two meet? I will try to draw some parallels between the two and uh, find some interesting connections. And hopefully, um, I will be able to uh, uh, convince you that it's worthwhile to explore these connections. And I think there, are, uh, there is a lot of room for uh, uh, research in the uh, connection of these two areas. So when we talk about the data science cycle, that's a typical uh, picture. Uh, uh, there are really distinct areas that come into play here. So one is business understanding, which is not so much what we computer scientists do, right? We need to understand the problem, we understand the business. Uh, where's the money? Um, and then there is the stage of data understanding, which is partly business and partly computer science in the sense that um, there are supporting systems that are being developed for uh, a, what is known as data exploration. We try to find if there's interesting, if there's something interesting in the data, if there's something to work with. Um, then there's data preparation. And data preparation is really mostly uh, 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 databases. Daniel? Yeah, sorry about that. Oh. Sorry about that. Yeah, I'm just going to um, Then there's data preparation, which is really mostly about databases. And then there's modeling. And modeling is... Um, really a, a, a machine learning problem, right? So that's the AI people. And if we talk about explanations, that's where explainable AI comes into play. So I will mostly talk about data provenance here in data preparation, querying, cleaning, etc., and explainable AI here. And I will also talk a little bit about how these things connect to uh, explanations in other areas, such as data and doctor. So why do we even need to explain? I think by now that's uh, common knowledge that explanations are important. Uh, uh, so transparency is crucial both in words, um, inside the organization. If we want to debug the process, we want to optimize it and outwards. If we want to justify decision-making, uh, that's the outcome of the data science process. Uh, and, and why do we want that? We want to increase the trust. We want to follow regulation. You all know of the uh, EU GDPR regulation that uh, uh, in some cases they, they force us to make it to, to find explanations to uh, decisions that we make. So a common example that people use is loan requests. We, um, if we have an automated uh, decision process to support uh, decisions regarding loan requests and uh, the, the AI said that we need to deny a request. Okay, fine, but why was the request denied? And what data is the decision based on and what can change it? Are really questions that we ought to be able to answer. And uh, as I will, I will show, as I will demonstrate, there are existing notions for explanations for the different parts of the data science cycle that, uh, that I've mentioned, but they are quite different. They come from the database resource community and they come from the machine learning com community for different uh, uh, boxes here, but we will see some connections. And the connections will partly be conceptual that is notions that uh, transfer, that go from machine learning to databases and, and, and back, as well as concrete. So um, I will demonstrate uh, at least one example where the, the fact that we are explaining machine learning inside the data science cycle should change the way we look at explanation. 
So when we talk about research on explanations, what do we even do? So uh, we do research on modeling, which is what do we explain? What is the computational model? And whether we're explaining individual results or the module as a whole. And that's an important distinction that I will make between explaining the, for instance, a single prediction and trying to explain machine learning model as a whole. We have uh, parallels in databases also. Then what is even an explanation, right? So that depends on the use case. Uh, if whether we're trying to debug the process, do hypothetical reasoning, et cetera. So that's the modeling aspect. Then as always, there's the computational uh, uh, question. Uh, uh, explanations are often costly. So data provenance is notoriously costly. And that's a barrier to, for, for its use in, uh, in practice, the, the complexity of data provenance. And then there is evaluation. So how do we know that explanations that we computed are uh, 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 good enough for the purposes we intend? So in the context of query results, there is a long line of research on that. That's called data provenance. So provenance uh, is a word that comes from art to describe the, um, everything that happened to an artwork, who owned it, who sold it, for what price, at what time period, etc. And, uh, and this notion was borrowed to databases. And there it means a record of the tuples that participated in a computation, the records from the database that, that participated in a computation as well as the ways in which they participated. So I will show a quick example. So let's say that we are interested in uh, uh, customers with overdraft events after 2006, and we are evaluating this query. So this is natural language, but we can write it in SQL, that's an easy, an easy task. And we get a result. So we get this Smith guy, uh, but we want to know why was Smith an answer? Why is Smith an answer for this query? So the reason, there's a formal way of defining the reason via the notion of semi-rings. And the idea is as follows, uh, the basic idea. We look at the tuples that the rows from the input database that contributed to the computation of a particular output. So in this case, it's the customer name Smith and the details of the event recorded in the bank database for, for this guy. So that's P1 and C1. So, this may be captured by multiplication in an algebraic structure called semi-ring. Um, another operation in this algebraic structure is plus, and this corresponds to alternative explanations. So there is another reason why Smith is an answer, and that's the event three combined with the row that associates the event three with Smith. So we get two distinct answers, and we can represent these answers as monomials in a polynomial. And it turns out that semi-rings are really the right structure for a limited kind of queries, what is called SPJU queries, select, project, join, and union queries. In what sense are they, is, is it the right structure? Well, in the sense that uh, the a, a, a two equivalent queries, we can show the two equivalent queries, no matter how the query optimizer looks at the query and actually executes it, two equivalent ways of executing the query will yield equivalent uh, uh, provenance expressions in the semi-ring structure. It's just that the axioms of semi-rings correspond very nicely to the equivalence axioms of select project join and union query. And it has further uh, uh, favorable properties, this uh, structure, uh, uh, its size is only polynomial. It commutes with homomorphism, which essentially says that we can um, assign values to these uh, uh, variables and we can then compute stuff. For instance, if you want to know what would happen to this square result, if this row was absent, we can just assign zero to P1 and one to the, ad, to, a, 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 to the other annotations and just evaluate this over this polynomial. So that's very efficient. And that's a way to do what is known as a, a, a hypothetical reasoning. We reason about how the result would look if the database would change. So that's a one very concrete application of, of, of explanations. And that's one notion that we can have in mind when we are computing explanations. But sometimes when we compute explanations, we really want to show them to somebody, right? That's the first thing that comes into mind if we are talking about explanations. And that's not something you can show this poor guy if he's asking, oh, why was my loan request denied? You, it, it's hard to tell them P1 times C1 plus P3 times C2, right? Unless they are mathematicians. So really the issues are, how do we model, how do we model the a, a provenance? What do we capture? Do we capture these kinds of uh, connections between the different tuples or just the fact that they participated? 
if we do want to capture these connections, what are the right axioms? So semi-rings work for uh, SPGU queries, but what happens if we have negation? What happens if we have updates in the queries? And so forth. Issues of complexity, these uh, expressions tend to uh, grow uh, quite quickly in practice, even though they are polynomials, polynomial in size. So uh, we need to be able to abstract the provenance, summarize it, filter it. And recently we are uh, looking into privacy. Um, so the thing is, if you look at these polynomials, it's fairly easy to understand what the query was. And that may be a concern. If we're trying to explain something to Smith, we may not want Smith to know what was the logic that we followed uh, uh, to decide whether uh, 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 to approve a loan request or not, right? So we want to explain a particular instance without revealing the underlying query. So, so this is just to give you a taste of the kind of questions that people are looking at in data provenance. Another example is that of uh, explanations. So usually when we are, we say data provenance, uh, what we're trying to explain is individual query results. We're trying to explain this myth. And uh, like I said, we maybe we even want to obfuscate the uh, uh, query logic, but, but in general, we don't want to explain everything that goes on in the query. We want to explain a particular answer. And this in contrast to other works, that for instance, work on trying to translate SQL to natural language. But I claim that the two are not unrelated. We can sometimes, that's the basic idea that we will see also in the context of explanations for ML. Um, sometimes these local notions of explanation coincide and work nicely together with global notions of explanation. So here's a quick example. Um, so uh, we asked ourselves, are there situations where we can present something that is it is nicer to the to the user to to a non-expert, and in particular, we were interested in explaining um, uh, provenance in natural language. So the point uh, of this work is that if we start with a natural language query that is compiled into SQL, and there are systems that do that quite nicely these days, and then we have further information that we can leverage even when we are trying to explain a particular query result. Uh, and this information is the structure, the syntactical structure of the question. So look at this question. So we are just looking at uh, something very simple. It's, uh, uh, it's a, a, a syntax tree. Um, and then we're asking why Smith an answer like before, but instead of presenting this complex uh, uh, provenance, this complex algebraic uh, uh, expression, we can try to plug in the different parts of the algebraic expression back into the sentence. So we know that owners was mapped by the natural language interface to uh, something that queries the owner table. Well, okay, we, then the provenance, the part of provenance of Smith um, uh, 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 in the evaluation that, that belongs to the owner's table is this C name Smith. This is a cell from the table. So we know actual values from the table that participated in the computation of a particular answer we can plug these uh, parts of the provenance back into the syntax tree and actually generate an answer. So we do that without machine learning. We do that in, in very, very naive tools uh, from natural language uh, perspective. And uh, we are able to pull this off because we have the structure of the original question. So the uh, answer, the uh, explanation in natural language does not look very unsimilar. It, it's quite similar actually to the structure of the original question with concrete values from the database plugged in at the right places. So we can get, we, can, we, we have a system that generates uh, explanation of the sorts. Smith is the owner of this account with this sober draft event on this date. And that's something that we can already show Smith. We can take this further and summarize, put together multiple uh, monomials, multiple explanations from the provenance to get a summarized form, such as Smith is the owner of three accounts with 13 overdraft events, etc. So that's a, just a, a quick example of uh, what we are looking at in the context of data provenance and how we can leverage something that's more global in order to explain a local answer, a single answer. Let's go to the other end of the spectrum and let's look, talk now about explaining machine learning modules. Um, uh, machine learning models. So there, there is also this distinction of whether we are trying to explain the model as a whole or trying to explain individual predictions. 
And for the former, trying to explain the model as a whole, there are early works on trying to approximate neural networks using simple models, uh, for instance, rule-based models or decision trees. But we know by now that uh, there's only so much you can do in this approach. There are inherent limitations on the complexity of the model. And especially if we're talking now about deep learning and deep neural networks, this can only take us so far. And then in recent years, there's flourish of works, really tons of works on uh, extending individual predictions. And of course, that's not a, a disjoint. So you can, for instance, rerun the explanation module on different instances to get more, more global insights. And in a sense, that's the, the parallel of what we just saw in data problem. Another important distinction is that often when we try to explain machine learning model, it makes sense to look at the model as a black box. Uh, whereas we almost never do that in data provenance. So we, we typically assume that we have the query and that it's simple enough. The reason is that, um, well, the machine learning model is often so complex that even if it's not really a black box, it's a white box where it's uh, very, very difficult to look, it, to look into, right? Uh, so, um, so a lot of these works focus on explanations for black boxes. And there are multiple uh, uh, papers and multiple systems that do that. So I will talk about two of them, Lime and Sharp, but there are others such as DeepLift and, and others that uh, 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 try different approaches for this same problem. So um, I guess a lot of you are familiar with Lime. Um, Lime is a, a system for explaining individual predictions of a black box model, so it can explain the prediction of any model, um, essentially. And its basic idea is quite simple. So the idea is that we're trying to explain uh, the a prediction of a model on a point X. Um, the way to do that is we're applying perturbations. So we change a little bit the point X that we are trying to explain. We get multiple points and we can weigh them according to the distance from X. Now we run the model and that's an assumption that we can uh, run the model uh, on any point that we are uh, interested in. And we retrieve the model predictions on these per perturbed instances. So what we get is we get the way that the model behaves in the area of X. And the claim of Lime, which uh, was proven experimentally, is that uh, once you are trying to focus on a particular area, it does make sense to try to approximate even complex models, even deep neural networks, using simple models such as, uh, such as linear models even. Um, and once you have linear models, you, you want the game of explanations because uh, linear models are inherently uh, interpretable. Uh, you can just take, for instance, the, if, if we're looking at image classification, you can just take the uh, pixels or the super pixels, the areas that uh, are weighed uh, positively by the linear model. Um, and it works very nicely. So uh, 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 for instance, that's the explanation that Lime gives on this, uh, uh, on the classification of this image. So there are uh, uh, two labels that, are, uh, that have uh, a very similar uh, confidence level, electric guitar and uh, uh, acoustic guitar. And the explanations show you why, because this area fits uh, the uh, uh, structure of an electric guitar, and this one looks more like an acoustic guitar, and the dog is not related to the guitar, it's related to the face of the dog. So you really get a nice uh, visual uh, uh, explanation of uh, the different labels uh, produced by um, this system. And uh, uh, this is work from the University of Washington and, and it received quite a lot of attention in both the machine learning and the database communities. Um, and then the point is that works like Lime and others, they treat the machine learning model in isolation. And as we saw in the data science cycle, the modeling comes after we already understood the data, we did data preparation, uh, it doesn't stand on its own. And uh, this has an effect on the way that we should compute the uh, explanations. That's one of the take home messages that I will, I will try to convince you. Mm -hmm. um, in particular, they say that about 80% of the work of the data scientist is not even about this part of modeling and evaluation, but rather is about cleaning the data and curating it and finding the right structure. So 
it, the explanations should take into account all the work done here somehow. And here's an example. So we know from 40 years, uh, uh, almost 15 now of uh, uh, database research, that good, DB, good database design includes setting constraints of the database instances. So if the input for the machine learning model is not just any data that's in the wild, but rather it's a database, a relational database, um, then there are all kinds of constraints that come into play. There are domain constraints, there are, the domain constraints that tell us that uh, a particular cell should belong to a particular domain. And there are functional dependencies that tell us how the different rows in the table should um, uh, uh, interact. So uh, all kinds of constraints that involve multiple rows. And denial constraints, which, which again, um, restrict the way that uh, uh, different rows can coincide in the, in the single table. Um, so now if a machine learning is run on such a database, all the data that's, that is plugged in uh, to the model in the training phase, and then all the data that it will see in the test phase also, should adhere to these constraints. But the point is that if we take a system like Lime or uh, other perturbation-based uh, analysis, the perturbations are just technical steps, right? So they are not part of the data. So usually the constraints are ignored. Um, but for instance, if the constraints changes one piece of data so that the city, let's say it's the, the personal data of, uh, of some individual, and uh, uh, it changes the data so that the city is Tel Aviv, but the country changes uh, to USA, that's not very informative, not for the intermediate step of the perturbation and certainly not to be presented as explanations. So we do need to take these constraints into account. Somehow it's not just these uh, blue and red areas of classification that we had before, but also we have this yellow area of which uh, of the, uh, 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 how the data should look like, and that should be taken into account. Um, so we know that, uh, and, and we, have, we have quite a lot of empirical evidence for that. And uh, uh, as a simple example, even not in the context of databases, but rather in the context of image classification, um, let's look at what happens if we try to avoid what Lime is doing, which is learning a model, but rather we're trying to present the modifications themselves as explanations. So let's say we are trying to find minimal perturbations that will change the classification of a particular image. That's known in machine learning as adversarial learning, right? As adversarial machine learning. Uh, that's trying to fool the model so that it will change its classification. And actually the best way to do that, the minimal overall changes that you can do uh, to fool a model is by actually changing a little bit all pixels. But that's, that's very clear that that's not very good as an explanation, right? In contrast, if we change a little bit the problem and now we're looking for minimal changes, but we're, we're restricting them. So that for instance, uh, we are looking at minimal changes of uh, a, a, a pixel a, a shade that change also a, a limited number of pixels or a limited number of super pixels. Then you see that the modifications are centered around the particular area which is more suitable for explanation, even in this context. And, and there are user studies, uh, we, we conducted one, that show that if you show these kinds of explanations to people, it's uh, much better to show them explanations that adhere to constraints, in this case, on the uh, uh, amount of change that you're doing, on the number of pixels that uh, you're do, you changing in a picture. But how is that only related to databases? So we can really formalize this problem uh, uh, in a general fashion. We are looking at the set of po potential modifications, but we are restricting the modifications so that the modified point uh, should adhere to a, to a set of constraints. And what are these constraints? This is a, a, a general problem formulation. We will see where these constraints come from in a second. But we are trying to change the, uh, we're trying to change uh, the uh, point in a minimal way so that the classification changes in a way that, for instance, is over a threshold. We know that this problem is NP-hard in general, and we uh, propose a heuristic algorithm that basically perturbs and projects in terms. So we change a little bit the a, a input vector so that the classification changes, but then maybe we are out of the yellow area, so we need to project it back on the constraints to get back to the yellow area 
but then we are maybe again in the blue area, so we need to iterate until we get to a point where is which is which has the right label with the right confidence and is also uh, in the yellow area that is uh, corresponds to the uh, constraint. So now we have two disjoint problems. One, which is essentially an ML problem. How do we perturb the uh, input of a given model so that it changes the uh, classification and we do it with minimal changes? Um, that's easy for linear models. That's easy for decision trees. You can just look at the structure of the model itself. Uh, for random forests, it's become NP hard and uh, we have heuristics, the simple heuristic in this case that finds the minimal changes for every tree and uh, iterates over all the trees. So we, we, we don't know when we're changing the decision of one tree, it changes in unexpected way the decisions of others. So we need to find the optimal out of all changes. And for neural networks, this corresponds to back propagation. Now, when we talk about back propagation, we need to remember again this issue of adversarial examples. If you would only do back propagation, the result is not suitable for explanation. That's exactly what uh, uh, people can do in adversarial machine learning. That's not good enough. But once we combine it with projection over the uh, constraints, we do get something that's um, uh, informative. Um, the question is, how do we even compute the projection? And this highly depends on the properties of the constraints, of course. Um, so we know from uh, uh, decades of research on uh, uh, optimization, um, that we have different techniques uh, uh, where uh, in cases where the constraints are linear or convex or disjunction of convex. But how will we know what's, what's suitable, which algorithm to use? So then this is the place where uh, this, this synergy between database research and machine learning uh, research can come into play. Um, we're talking about machine learning models that run over a database. So these constraints don't just come out of the blue, they come from the database. And in the database, uh, 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 we know how to characterize the constraints. So there are domain constraints, which have a particular form, and check constraints that have a particular form. So we can really tailor each, uh, we, we can mix and match optimization algorithms based on the kind of integrity constraints that uh, are imposed on the database and find one that is uh, most suitable for each case. It may be disjunction of, in, in many cases, it, it, this disjunction of um, a convex uh, a constraints and uh, often not too many. So this uh, a, a works quite well in practice. How do we even know that the uh, uh, explanations that we have generated are uh, useful? So I've shown you before an example of a use of study that's not always suitable and it's not always uh, reliable enough. Uh, so evaluations that done by humans on the quality of explanations may be biased for uh, uh, different reasons. Uh, and we, we looked for something more objective. And um, in this, uh, in this uh, simple example, uh, what we did is we took um, a bank marketing data set, which is a data set common, commonly used uh, to um, test the uh, performance of machine learning models. We trained um, a model which was not so great. We trained it on a, 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 a not so, so uh, a large data set. And we got a mediocre model. And then we tried to improve it. And, and the, uh, the way to improve it was to take K random errors from the validation set and add them and all the explanations and all the perturbations to the train set along with the correct label. And then we evaluated what happened with the a, 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 a retrained model on the, on the test set. So the results show that the constraints were really useful in this uh, respect. So in green, we see the F1 improvement of this process compared to the original model when we used our solution with constraints over the database. Uh, in uh, uh, red, we added no explanations. We just retrained the model on the point where uh, uh, it erred, which is a well-known approach. And, and this already improves the model quite nicely. Uh, but what's maybe surprising is that when we try to enrich the train set with the perturbations, ignoring the constraints, what we got was, was uh, uh, even not as good as just enriching the model with the points where it erred. So 
The thing is that if you try to train the model on, 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 on retrain the model on points that do not adhere to the constraints, these are not natural points. These are not the points that uh, uh, the model will see at test time, and that's not as good. So the constraints really help us uh, in this particular use case. Um, there are quite a lot of uh, computational problems here. Uh, uh, this uh, perturbant project uh, 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 algorithm uh, uh, requires uh, roughly 10 to 20 iterations for uh, uh, practical models. Uh, for random forest, for instance, we can do better. We can combine the perturbant project phase into a single quadratic program. Uh, and uh, uh, that's more efficient specifically for random forests. We can't do that uh, in general. We cannot do that for, for neural networks. Um, and uh, uh, I think there's room for uh, uh, further improvements in this respect. Then the next thing we looked at, and that's uh, another example that I wish to show you on the combination of database and machine learning techniques, um, is uh, to solve the, uh, the problem of temporality in this respect. So things change over time, right? So uh, if we're looking again on this uh, a, a loan applicant example, so at one time point, this guy may ask for a loan and get rejected. And uh, if we have a great explanation uh, mechanism, uh, the explanation may be, well, uh, the, uh, the top uh, reason for the denial is the debt, and then uh, uh, the fact that you rent a place and don't own one. So this uh, poor guy works for two years to decrease their debt, only to find out that meanwhile the model has changed and uh, now is rejected again with completely different reasons. Um, so if we're thinking about explanations as ways of recommending course of actions to people, then we need to take this into account that uh, a course of action takes time to implement. And meanwhile, things may change. The data may change, the models may change, um, and so on. So that's one thing that we want to improve. We want to be able to account at least to some extent to this issue of temporality. And another thing is that uh, being database people, we, we ask questions, that's what we do. Um, we, we query things, we query databases, and we can treat this whole thing as if it's a, a huge database and we want to query the process. So we want to ask questions such as, what is the closest time point that I should reapply if I can't do anything, I cannot change my status? Or what is the smallest set of features whose modification can lead to approval? Or what is a minimal change whose modification is, is expected to lead to approval? So I don't want to generate one solution that uh, uh, answers one of these questions or all of them, uh, but rather taking a database approach, I want to build an engine that uh, is able to answer all of these questions. So essentially support query evaluation over the explanations for machine learning models. And that's what we did. Um, here's how our solution looks like uh, at a high level. Um, so we have a user who is interested in, um, for instance, getting his loan request uh, approved. Uh, and, uh, and we have a machine learning model. And we don't really know how this model is going to look in, uh, in two years. But we can apply out of the box uh, solutions for uh, uh, this is called domain adaptation. We can try to predict how the model will look like based on, for instance, linear interpolation of the data. So we first predict uh, how the uh, data will look like in two years, the training data. And then we use that to predict how the model will look like. This works uh, with, uh, um, in, it, it, there aren't great solutions that do that because we cannot predict the future, but uh, uh, there are solutions that work fairly well under reasonable assumptions for that. Um, and then we get we get a list of models, a list of anticipated models uh, uh, at time points in the future. We have constraints, so we have some information on how the data of the user itself is going to change uh, in the over the the next few years. We throw all these things together into a database, uh, and we generate uh, what is uh, uh, called the constraint database. So there's um, um, quite a lot of research in the database uh, theory community uh, 
on constraints databases, databases that do not include a single tuple, but rather allow us to model and query areas, model and query constraints. So we can put these constraints, and I will, I will show examples of what constraints we generate, into a database. And essentially, what this database stores is all possible ways of changing the uh, model outcome. All possible ways of changing the input, perturbing the input in viable ways according to the constraints, that would change the model outcome in the desired way. So again, instead of trying to compute a single explanation, we generate a database of possible explanations in a sense. And once we have this database, we can query it and come up with recommendations that are uh, uh, most suitable for a particular user. And um, the techniques we are using are uh, coming from uh, uh, the database theory uh, 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 world. Um, again, this is called constraint databases. And we can compile, for instance, a decision tree into, um, um, in, in, into essentially um, a set of areas to be stored in a constraint database. How many areas, how many regions do we get? So if we start with a tree-based ensemble, for instance, with a random forest, we know that all positive regions may be stored in a constraint database whose size is exponential in the number of trees, L to the power of N, where L is the number of leaves and N is the number of trees. And we know, assuming P is uh, uh, not in P, that this exponential dependency on N is unavoidable. So we cannot do better than exponential in N. But then again, we again, so we borrow this idea from Lime and other works. Uh, in, in a sense, what we were trying to do here is we are trying to approximate the entire model, the entire random forest, with a constraint database, which is a simpler model. And like I said before, this has inherent limitations, right? So what helps us, what saves us here, is that we are looking to help a particular guy, a particular applicant. So we're looking on, on individual predictions. And it turns out that if we are looking at individual predictions, that's not surprising in a sense, um, the number of regions that we need to look at, which are in the locality of the instance, so we're not looking at all regions of the random forest, we're looking at regions that are in the locality of a given instance, uh, we can generate them more efficiently. Again, that's heuristic. So we don't have, uh, we don't, uh, have guarantees on what we are generating. But once we, fo once we focus that, that's something we learned from Lime. Once we focus on a particular uh, instant, on a particular uh, a, a point that the model is looking at, things become simpler. So just a quick example. Uh, uh, we have an applicant that comes with uh, income 20 and amount 50, and uh, uh, this guy rents his home. He doesn't own it. So we look at how the model reacts to this applicant, so each tree uh, gives a score and the, a, a, the overall prediction of the random forest is an average of the scores of the three of the, of the individual trees. Uh, and there are some constraints that say, for instance, that they must rent a home, they cannot own it. So some, some paths here become irrelevant. So then we try to identify positive regions by altering the decision of any single tree. Uh, for instance, when we do that on the first tree, we try to move from 0.2 to 0.7. Um, we are not really perturbing the data. We are computing the conditions. Now we are storing all the conditions because we want to store something that's queryable. So what we will store is the constraint that says the income must be less than 30 and the amount should be less than 10, plus all the constraints that were given uh, a, by the user. And we can compute the effect of doing that over all trees. We do that for a seed point out of the uh, area, the one that's uh, uh, closest to the original point of the applicant. Here again, it helps us that we are focusing on a, a given instance. And we get a score. We get a score that's an estimation of what we would get if we would move the applicant uh, to the closest point in uh, this area. Uh, and then we repeat, we repeat and we try to do that for other uh, trees. Each tree gives us a different constraint and we combine all of them together. Again, we apply this process, we compute the, the a new score. And essentially what we get here 
is we get a set of proposals of how the user could uh, change their profile and the ways that we anticipate this will um, affect the model. And we store all this in a database. So we store all this in the database, including these areas. And this is why we need the constraint database. We need a database that's uh, 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 optimized for querying such uh, uh, expressions. We apply further optimizations that I will not get into, such as trying to expanding each region by picking a seed and rerunning this algorithm starting from this point. Uh, we get some regions uh, in this process that are too far from the initial point of the uh, actual user. So we prune them and we repeat and we generate um, a set of proposals this way. That's just heuristic uh, uh, solutions. We have no guarantees for it, but uh, uh, it's, we see that it works quite well in practice. And we actually implemented the prototype system that's called just in time that allows users to feed in their personal preferences and their constraints, generates this kind of constraint database that contains the explanations, which in this case are proposals of how to modify the input so that the a, a classification would change in the desired way. And then all these proposals, instead of presenting them, trying to present them as we did in previous works that I uh, have described and as is done in Lime and other works, we are not presenting them to the user, but rather we are allowing the user to query them. And we query them with uh, something that's essentially uh, SQL uh, with uh, a particular functions designed uh, to query uh, uh, preferences, to, to, to query constraints. And the result is really a recommendation for a, a course of action, depending on the query. So people can ask, what is the closest time in which reapplying without modification will be approved? And they get an answer. What modifications would maximize the change of getting approved? So uh, we can show uh, a, a recommendation. So you can reapply in 2019, but you need to change this and that. And then we have um, this percentage of confidence uh, that the uh, model will actually um, classify uh, uh, your profile in the desired way um, and all kinds of explanations that look like that. So uh, for instance, we applied these four queries over uh, 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 the home credit, uh, over the home credit data set, which is a data set uh, uh, that people use uh, uh, to, to train and test machine learning models. Uh, and we got some recommendations. We got the same, we did the same for Lending Club, et cetera. These are standard data sets that are used as benchmarks. Um, and uh, for instance, uh, the recommendation to this guy is to decrease the debt to income to 21.43. Sometimes the recommendation combines changing multiple features, um, et cetera. So these are the kind of insights we can offer to our users. Okay. I want to conclude uh, uh, in uh, about uh, uh, five minutes uh, uh, with uh, just another example of um, a connection between machine learning explanations and uh, explanation in databases. Um, and this connection is uh, a, a, a mostly conceptual and it's based on the notion of Shapley values. So um, by now, I, I'm sure many of you have heard on, uh, 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 about the use of Shapley values in uh, machine learning. So Shapley values is a notion coming from game theory. It was designed uh, originally to decide how to assign payouts to players, depending on the contribution to the game. Um, essentially, it looks at all ways in which uh, a particular player A can participate in a game and can combine with other uh, 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 people, uh, with other uh, players coming in all orders. And it looks at the marginal contribution of A to the game in all these scenarios is averaged over all possible scenarios in which they collaborate with other um, players. So in machine learning, uh, uh, this was adopted as a way of uh, uh, quantifying the contribution of each feature value for a given prediction. Again, we're looking at single instances. So the game in this case is the prediction task and the players are the feature values of the given instance. And the gain is measured in terms of the prediction. Um, 
And that was uh, uh, proven to be very effective. So there was a system uh, uh, called SHARP. Uh, uh, there's a package, a Python package, and it, uh, it's uh, um, very useful and very well accepted in both the uh, research and uh, practical uh, uh, communities. It combines ideas from Lime from uh, this idea of uh, uh, computing Shapley value. Uh, one of the, problem is that, of the problems is that you see this, uh, this formula is exponential by nature, uh, but Sharp uh, 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 proposes an adaptation and proposes multiple ways of uh, computing efficiently the value that, uh, that it assigns to the different players. One of them called kernel Sharp is actually based on Lime. So it's, it's based on using Lime with particular uh, 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 properties, with particular configuration that computes uh, uh, the contribution of each feature. And there is a, a very exciting recent work uh, uh, on uh, trying to use Shapley values in a completely different context, which is the context of query evaluation. Um, and uh, uh, the idea is that what they're trying to do that they're assigning contributions to endogenous facts in the database and quantifying how much they contribute to the uh, result of say a numerical query. So that's a way of quantifying the contribution of each tuple to the query result. If, if you, you look back at what we saw in the beginning, these provenance polynomials, they show us the contribution of each tuple and how they connect with each other to contribute to the query result, but they don't quantify the, the, uh, this notion of provenance semi-rings, does not quantify, does not tell us how much each tuple contributed to the query result. And we can try to do something such as counterfactuals to try to see whether removing a fact will uh, change the output. But often, as in the example I've shown you before uh, of the loan request, it's not the case that the removal of a single tuple would uh, even change the database, but still they contribute, they just contribute together. Um, so this work by uh, 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 Lifshitz, Bertossi, Kimmelfeld, and, and Sebag, and other works uh, uh, by uh, this group, um, offers for the first time a, a, a way to quantify the contribution of each tuple that is based on this notion of Shapley values. And I think that's, that's a major breakthrough in the sense that if we look back at the, at the data science cycle, it makes a lot of sense to use the same measure to explain all parts. I don't think if, if we're looking at adoption by the industry, uh, they're not going to use millions, me million measures of uh, explanations. They're not going to use different measures of explanations for this part and this part. Or it, it will be very hard to convince them to do that. Uh, if we are able to, for instance, use sharply for the different, all different parts of the data science cycle, I think. Practically speaking, uh, this has the potential to um, encourage the adoption of such a, a solutions in practice. Um, so in recent work, we're trying to take this uh, 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 maybe a step uh, backward in a sense in the uh, cycle and trying to see if we can explain using sharply other parts of the process. So for instance, data preparation. Um, so there is a, there's an, a pressing need for explanations for data cleaning. So the data cleaning process, the process of trying to change the a, a database so that it, it adheres to some constraints, some integrity constraints to fix errors in the database. That's a process that's becoming more and more complex. And actually people are now using machine learning for that as well. So there's a system uh, uh, called Holoclean that's uh, that wi widely used and it uses machine learning. So then again, we can ask the question, why did you change the country from Espania to Spain? And this begs explanations again, because it's not clear that the change is correct. It's not clear that this, this change is applicable to other tuples and uh, 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 there's a need to explain that. And uh, it makes sense, especially since these models are uh, uh, based on machine learning, it makes sense to use Shapley. And that's what we did here. So uh, we use Shapley to quantify the contribution of each cell of the database over the changes made to a particular cell. So we want to know why was Spania changed to Spain? Well, it's mostly because of these cells in the row and their connections to other cells. Um, and we can even quantify using Shapley uh, 
the contribution of each particular cell and each particular um, constraint to the uh, fix of a particular cell made by a cleaning algorithm. Uh, the main issue is performance. So you know we can use we can use Sharply to explain anything, but it's it's costly. And uh, we try to use Sharp, but it's not optimized for this task, and it's, it indeed does not scale in this context. Uh, so we had to develop a concrete pruning, a pruning, dedicated pruning heuristics to be used in conjunction with sampling. So the idea is to sample the different uh, uh, subsets that are used in conjunction with a cell that we want to explain. But if we look at all subsets, that's of course costly. So we need to do sampling and we need to prune them. We are able to do that uh, uh, because we, we identify some concrete properties of the repair process that allow us to uh, restrict sampling but not to lose the convergence properties that we have. So that's always the challenge uh, uh, if we use Sharply. Just one last example uh, from this area of data understanding. So here the uh, need for explanation is a bit different. So uh, here we are using explanation as a form of uh, generating documentations. Uh, what happens in data exploration uh, uh, often is that people try to analyze manually, try to analyze their database or, or, or semi-manually, try to analyze their database by looking at what other people did on this data set or on other data sets that are similar. So um, people publish their analysis. They publish their analysis, uh, for instance, of uh, a, a data set on flight delays. So they did all kinds of manipulations on the data and got all kinds of insights. But then we see only the, the, uh, the product, the product of this analysis. And it lacks documentation often. And when it lacks documentation, it's very hard to understand it. So we would like the analyst to publish the documentation along with the notebook, but that's not really realistic. So what we do is we generate these documentations automatically. Uh, here's an example. So we have a data set of flights and this, uh, this particular analyst uh, uh, filtered the data set to find all flights with duration uh, 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 greater than 90, we want to know why. So we, we don't really know why this particular guy did that, but uh, we can try to find out what is interesting in the generated view. And there are well-established notion of interestingness, what it means to be interesting. Diversity of the data is one, uh, exceptionality is another. So something that's really different about this view compared to other views of the data set uh, uh, that appeared before. And uh, we can analyze all kinds of measures and find which is the most prominent, in this case, exceptionality. And then it's not enough to just say, oh, well, this, this view is interesting because it's exceptional. Uh, but in, in what sense is it, is it exceptional? So here we use sharply to quantify the contribution of each part of the view on this high exceptionality. So in this case, we know that the major deviation was on departure time morning with this airport. And uh, then we can, this is, this is a um, much better explanation than just saying that uh, uh, the view is exceptional. We can really quantify what, is the, what, what are the contributors for this exceptionality. And these are the interesting parts of the views. So that's what we do essentially. Given a notebook, we find the right interestingness measure out of uh, a closed set, we look at diversity, conciseness, exceptionality, etc. And then we find the top K uh, elements according to Shapley values uh, that contribute to this particular measure. And then the rest is just UI. So we use, for instance, natural language patterns to present um, the explanations in a clear fashion. So we actually take notebooks of actual analysts and we enrich them uh, by uh, uh, generating uh, a automatic, a, a, a automatically generating explanation for each step. For group by, we show high diversity, for instance. And then for this step, there is no interesting explanation. But then for the filter, we show, we say, well, this was because it has high exceptionality. Uh, we know uh, by a uh, uh, full user studies with uh, data scientists that these kinds of explanations make the notebooks more uh, uh, useful to, for them. It's more useful to look at these kinds of things when you're trying to analyze a given data set or even a new one. So to conclude, um, there's really a flourish of work in recent years on uh, explainability. 
both in the database and the machine learning communities. Uh, uh, we do believe that explanations are required for each part of the data science, of the data science cycle, and further that uh, uh, it's, um, it's beneficial not to study each uh, a module of the cycle in isolation, but rather trying to find solutions that interact. So examples are modeling where the database constraints would be accounted for when we compute the machine learning explanations. Um, we can uh, uh, think of transfer of notions such as Chapley values, and in terms of implementation algorithms, uh, this declarative view of the problem that I've shown with query languages and constraint databases in, is an example of what uh, database research can contribute to uh, the uh, area of explainable AI or in, in general explanations for data science. Um, I think we, we've come a long way, but we're still very far from holistic solutions uh, for explainable data science. And I think there, there's a lot of exciting research to be done here by both communities. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Uh, any questions? I have one small comment. I'm far from being an expert, but uh, although the Shapley value is, of course, a beautiful and powerful tool, there's tons of, of uh, I mean, in the early years, this, is, uh, this has been a main theme in game theory, evaluating the power of players in a game. And I see no a priori reason why Shapley would be better than others. There are also tons of, of uh, terrific Israelis in this area. You know, I can, in our department, I can mention Nam Nisan, but uh, you know, if you ask me, I can tell you five terrific Israelis who, who can uh, take you to, to, to a tour in this area. And I see no a priori reason why Shapley would be the, the best solution to. I, I, I agree. I think that's, uh, that's debatable. So. Uh, for machine learning, I think now, uh, the SHAP tool is uh, overwhelmingly used. Uh, I think the paper was cited like 3,000 times and people use it in industry also. It's, um, they love it. Um, it. Theoretically speaking, it is based on a number of axioms, right? That make it, uh, and, and there's a, a proof that Shapley value is the only one uh, that you can use if you're interested in a particular axiom. There are other things like that in, in, right, in, for other notions uh, with other axioms. So it's not clear. I, I, I completely agree with you that it's not clear. This does not make it the perfect tool for explanations. What I'm saying is that at least in machine learning, people tend to think that it, 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 it works quite nicely. This is mostly based on ignorance, I suppose. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's a possibility. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, in databases, that's uh, that's fairly recent. So this work by uh, uh, by the group from the Technion is uh, from uh, 2020. Uh, it has also been very well received. Um, it's it's a good question. I think there are, before that there were lots of uh, notions uh, uh, proposed in database theory on how to quantify functions based on counterfactuals and based on responsibility. So there are also in the context of query evaluation, there are other notions out there that people use for uh, uh, quantifying the contributions. Yeah, so Moni is mentioning in the chat Banzaf, right? Yeah, Banzaf is uh, not so central, but Banzaf is an example, right? right. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, pretending to be an expert. I, I know the experts, this is what I can say. You should ask them. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I would be, I would, I would be happy to get into discussion on that. Um, I'm, I'm not sure there is a, I mean, I'm not sure we, we can hope for a, for a perfect notion of explanation, right? It, it all depends on what. No, no, of course, no, no. For various, uh, you know, tasks, uh, different, you know, this was the main, a main sport in, in game theory in the seventies. Mm -hmm. Write down a set of axioms and see what it gives you, and there is. This spot was played on many different, uh, you know, ways and, and many, it's beautiful uh, results. And uh, it may be that Chapley is uh, better than anything else for everything, but I tend to doubt it. Yeah. Okay, uh, if there's uh, no more questions, we're a little bit so Mira, out of time, Mira, so. Mira is asking, uh, in the, do I have a time to answer? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, just uh, that uh, 
30 seconds. Okay. So Mira is asking in the chat, uh, uh, how did you measure uh, whether your explanation is good? And that's a great question, uh, which is also related to what Nati uh, uh, has raised. Um, so there are a few ways uh, to do that. So one is user studies. People look at explanations and tell whether they are good or not. This, this works sometimes, but like I said, it has inherent limitations, right? So what's a good explanation to one may not be a good explanation to others. Um, sometimes we can do something that's more objective, and I try to show that here, uh, which is to use the explanation for something concrete. So in this case, uh, here, for instance, we didn't really show the explanation to anybody, but rather we've used it to, to retrain the model. So we took the explanations and we used it as new data points to be fed to the model for retraining. So I mean, maybe, maybe you wouldn't call it explanation anymore, but it's the same, the, the outcome of the same algorithm used in a particular way that's more objective. And another example is the hypothetical reasoning. So for instance, when we compute these provenance except, uh, 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 expressions, these polynomials, we can really measure how much time it takes to compute hypothetical reasoning over these compared to, for instance, rerunning the query. And that's a, a viable advantage we can show for uh, uh, the output of, uh, of these systems. I agree it's more complicated if you're looking at explanations that are presented to people. Okay, so we'll give you a virtual uh, end of applause again. Thank you, Thank you very much. And I, I, I apologize for the camera. I don't know. It's uh, after two semesters of teaching by Zoom or two and a half. This is the first time it's happened to me, so that's just bad, bad karma. Sorry. It got tired. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Sorry okay. Thank you, everyone. See you all next week. Thank you. Thank again, you very man. much for having Bye -bye. me. Thank you.